Hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Edwards. Thank you all so much for joining us here today for our Jet Foundation virtual workshop series. We are super excited to be hosting Dr. Jonathan Cordova today. We'll be talking about gastrointestinal health management for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, we're just going to start off in the next few minutes, so just hang on tight. Thank you. Hi everyone, for those of you who are just joining, my name is Danielle Edwards, I'm Jeff Foundation's Community Engagement Manager. Thank you so much for attending our virtual workshop series. We're super excited to be kicking off the month of May with Dr. Jonathan Cordova, who will be speaking about GI issues in Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients. Um, you'll have the opportunity to answer any, or to ask any questions you may have for him in the question section below. Just feel free to type those in in the chat. We're gonna kick it off now, um, now it's 12 o'clock. Again, thank you all so much for joining, and Please let us know if you have any other questions at the end of this. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cordova. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist at the North Shore University Health System uh, in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, it was a pleasure to be asked to give this talk again uh, to the DMD community here at the Jet Foundation. Uh, I've given this talk, uh, I think, the past two years at a lot of the round table meetings. Um, and I'm happy now to be able to give this talk again one more time uh, on a web platform so that um, our entire community can access uh, any GI health issues uh, that may arise in their children. So um, today I wanted to talk again a little bit about gastrointestinal health uh, with regard to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I have no financial disclosures. Uh, so I'm basing this talk uh, around an article that came out about two years ago in the Lancet of Neurology, 
with regard to things now called care considerations. Um, this is a great article that came out with regard to management, health maintenance, with regard to different aspects of our boys uh, who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And again, I'll focus mostly on the GI uh, system. So we'll break this talk down into three sections. We'll start first discussing some nutritional assessment aspects. We'll then talk about a couple disease processes that can happen both in the general population, but can be heightened in boys with Duchenne with regard to reflux and something called dysphagia. And then we'll spend a little time at the end talking about constipation, which we all know can be a problem uh, for our boys. So first off, nutritional assessment. So as a general pediatrician initially, this is something that should be happening at every visit uh, for every child, but particularly with our boys with Duchenne. So again, these are things we wanna take into account every visit that we have either with our pediatrician, with our nurse practitioner, uh, or with our DMD specialists. Things that we wanna take into account that we should be aware of and that we wanna focus on are what type of food uh, are our boys eating? What makes up a typical meal? Think about a typical breakfast, a typical lunch and dinner. You know, how much of that meal consists of carbohydrates? How much is protein? How much is fat? Um, and then take a look at the types of meal structures, right? Are we eating three scheduled meals a day or do we find that our boys are often snacking throughout the day, grazing? These are important things to take into account when we're trying to make a good assessment. Uh, portion control can be problematic, especially as some of our boys start to take medicines that as a side effect may increase their appetite, such as steroids. And then we really want to know how much fluid our, our boys are taking in, right? So in the types of fluids, so water is obviously a must, uh, but it's also important to know the other things that are going in, fruit juices, sodas, things that may just have empty calories, which may actually hinder um, our nutrition as we, as our boys continue to progress. Um, big goals that we're thinking about is we really want to prevent rapid weight gain. Uh, we want to assure that we're getting adequate micro, macronutrient intake, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. So fluid requirement, like we just alluded to, you know, water is the most abundant subject um, substance in your body. Um, for the medical folk out there, there is a formula that we can calculate based on your body weight, how much actual fluid your body needs. But in rough instances, just based on age, uh, this is a, a nice table that you can just kind of think about in the back of your head, you know, based on your age, our younger kids need about 40 ounces of fluid in a day. Our nine to 13 year olds might need about 64 ounces. And then our, you know, adolescents and young adults up to about th uh, 100 ounces a day or 13 cups of fluid per day, just on that, on estimates. Uh, shifting now to macronutrients. So these we touched about uh, briefly with regard to food composition. So carbohydrates, these are really used as a fundamental source of body energy. These consist of things like sugars and starches. They give you about four calories per gram of energy, and they typically supply about 50% of our body's uh, energy uh, in a typical day. Protein is the next macronutrient. Uh, this is really essential for cell structure. This is important for hormone production, antibody production, obviously for muscle development. Um, it can be used as a source of energy as well. The calories from protein are equivalent to that of carbohydrates, so about four calories per gram. Uh, and your daily protein requirement really varies depending on your age, uh, which we'll talk about briefly. And the last of the macronutrients is fat or lipid. These are our storage forms of energy. Um, but we can also use these in um, periods of stress as a energy source. Uh, and these are what we call our most calorically dense macronutrients. So these provide about nine up to 10 calories per gram of energy. This is a food pyramid, which uh, a lot of us may have grown up with, um, which came out in the 90s. And in essence, just guided our families into what we thought uh, was a standard way to approach meals. Um, at the bottom or the base of the pyramid really consisted of a lot of our grains and our bread products. Uh, and as you moved up in the pyramid, um, the quantity of the, of the food groups would decrease a little bit. So fruits and vegetables were the next most important, followed by some dairy, milk, yogurt, cheeses, some meats and poultries, and then obviously limiting the amount of fats uh, oils and sweets to, to be used sparingly. But we've actually gone away from this food pyramid concept and moved a little bit more towards uh, proportionate meals. So we're trying to use this new idea of, uh, it's called choose my plate, uh, where we add variety um, 
more fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains, leaner meats, um, and then choosing a low fat or fat free type of dairy. So again, a lot of this can be found online. If you go to the USDA's website or choosemyplate.gov, you'll, you'll find a lot of these, um, these resources. But again, the new thoughts are now to live a healthier lifestyle, especially for our boys um, as we become less ambulatory. These are gonna be very important. So again, we wanna focus on whole fruits. Um, we wanna vary the vegetables. You know, I, I often recommend to my patients in general to try and make your vegetables and fruits as colorful as possible on your plate. Um, that can sometimes spark some interest in kids wanting to try different types of, of fruits or veggies. Um, change up your proteins, right? So sometimes if you're having a meat or a beef, try and switch the next day to a fish um, of some sort. So that can be helpful as well. Uh, when you're picking grains, it's always better to choose whole grain versus, um, versus refined sugars. For dairy sources, obviously we do want to limit the fat intake. Remember whole milk has a higher fat content compared to 2%, 1% or skim. So, you know, choosing the, the lower calorically dense of those dairy products can be helpful. And then obviously continuing to, to limit the amount of, of saturated fat, added sugar, sweets, uh, and eating foods that have less sodium content uh, uh, is needed now. Briefly, we'll touch on a couple minerals um, that should be taken into account, especially with our boys. Um, so calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium, these are all important for skeletal growth. Um, calcium is the one that we probably think about most when we think about bone health. It's the most abundant mineral in your body. Phosphorus is used for cellular function, so it gives your cells energy, but it's also an important factor in, in keeping our bones healthy, as is magnesium. The other that we also think about is vitamin D. So this is very important for bone growth, especially in our maturing boys. This should be screened at least once a year, if not every other year, but I would argue once a year, vitamin D blood testing should be done. Um, this has a little bit to do with sunlight. So vitamin D in your skin gets activated by the rays of sun uh, and actually converts vitamin D in your skin into an active form of vitamin D inside your body. So getting sun exposure um, can, can boost your vitamin D. Uh, there are some foods here that I listed that are rich in vitamin D, such as dairy products, salmon, tuna, uh, orange juice, egg yolks, and oatmeal. The blood test comes back typically with a number. Um, that number is changing over the last several years, but still the, the consensus is that if, you're, if your value is less than 30, uh, you're considered vitamin D insufficient. You should start supplementing with a vitamin D supplement at least 2,000 international units or IUs per day. And if your vitamin D is less than 10, you're considered deficient in vitamin D. Uh, and you should really consider being on high dose prescription vitamin D, which is 50,000 international units um, once a week for about, about two months and then rechecking the level. The patients who tend to have a vitamin D lower than, than a, a level of less than 10 are the ones who are at biggest risk for bone fractures. So we do wanna be on top of our vitamin D status. All right, that's mostly about nutrition. Now, the other aspect of our nutritional assessment really has to do with growth. So these are things, again, that happen, should or should happen at every pediatric visit, every well-child check, even every uh, every sick visit. But of course, when you're with your um, DMD specialist, these should be occurring. These are where we wanna grab a weight, we wanna get a length. If we're still ambulatory, we'd like to get that um, standing if possible. Um, and if we're non-ambulatory, we still have means of, of checking different things to, to assess are we growing and how well are we growing. So um, we can look at um, knee height, so really from the uh, ankle up to the knee, and then we have some standards uh, that have been um, populated for us over the last several years to, to say for a certain age, are we continuing to grow appropriately? This is something that you should become familiar with. This is our growth assessment or our growth charts. Um, this particular chart is for boys who are ambulatory between the age of two to 20 without any disease. So this is for the general population. Uh, and the goal is really to fall anywhere between the 10th and the 80th, 85th percentile. Um, and remember that this is not specific to our boys with Duchenne. So that brings in, uh, out a good point that, you know, maybe we do need to start looking at a Duchenne uh, specific growth chart. So in 2013 in the Journal of Pediatrics, they aim to, to try and assess what the growth patterns were uh, for boys with Duchenne. So this was a nice study. 
Um, it looked at growth reference standards for boys that were still walking who were not receiving steroids um, between the ages of 2 and 12. So in essence, trying to really get that, that natural history of boys with Duchenne in terms of their growth. Um, it was a retrospective study, meaning it looked backwards but, um, from the dates of 1985 to 2010, so 25 years of data. It did over 500 boys, over 1,500 measurements, and their conclusion at the end was that boys with Duchenne tended to be shorter, shorter, they tended to be heavier, and therefore had a higher BMI than compared to boys in the general population. Um, this chart is depicting uh, what they came up with, their results from their study. It's a little difficult to see, I'm sorry, so I, I will use my mouse here if you can see. This first chart has to do with height, um, the solid lines being the boys with Duchenne, the, the dotted lines being the boys with um, from the general population, the controls. And you can see on average for the same percentile, our boys with Duchenne and the solid lines are shorter. On the side to the right, they end up being heavier. Therefore, our BMI, how heavy we are for how tall we are, tends to be higher. So on average, uh, a boy with Duchenne who's ambulatory and not seen steroids yet, at the 50th percentile, meaning at average, will have a BMI of 22, where for the general population, it's about 17 or 18. So you can see our standards should be are, are, are off a little bit compared to the general population. What about estimating our nutritional needs? So this is important, right? This is where we want to figure out how many calories we actually do need for our level of activity. Uh, again, it depends on your age, depends on how active you are. So your ambulatory boys will need a little bit more than your non-ambulatory boys. If you're on steroids, that is something that should be taken into account. And then also any cardiovascular or pulmonary compromise. So how well is our heart functioning, uh, as well as how are our lungs functioning? These are really important to know when you're assessing caloric need. Um, but there are no real defined guidelines out there or specifics. So we have to go off what kind of our experts are saying. And many of our experts say that if you're ambulatory, uh, you should get about 80% of what is recommended from the Dietary Reference Index or the DRI. Um, and if you're non-ambulatory, you should aim for about 70% of that goal. With regard to protein, still the goals are to meet about 10 to 30% of your daily intake. Um, and there's some controversy um, and the lack of research or cohesive research um, that suggests really any benefit of pushing protein up in our boys with Duchenne. So this is a nice chart that I just put together with regard to age and estimated calorie need. Um, and then based on whether or not you are ambulatory or not. So in the first column, you see the age. In the second column, you see the DRI or um, total calories that are recommended for that age. The next column is 80% of that, the ambulatory boys. This, the, the column to the right is the non-ambulatory or 70% of that. And then the, the recommended protein intake. So you can take a picture of this if you need or happy to share the slides with you when this talk is over. So goals for our nutrition, right? So this is really where we want to make sure that we're e eating a well-balanced diet with a variety of foods, shifting our, our sites away from the food pyramid and now choosing a more well-rounded, um, high fruit, high veggie, high clean, lean meats, uh, as, long, uh, as well as whole grains and, and low-fat dairy. Uh, we really do want to continue to limit the fat intake. Remember, fat... Uh, is our most calorically dense food, so we'll get a lot of calories and sometimes empty calories from that. Make sure that we're pushing our fluids. Water is very important, which we'll talk about again in, in the next couple slides. And then for vitamin D, make sure that that's getting checked at least once a year. And if you're low, make sure that we're supplementing. All right, so now we're going to move on to a few disease processes that may happen in our boys. They happen in the general population, uh, but they may be picked up uh, symptomatically in our boys with Duchenne. So we'll start with the upper GI tract. So this is a schematic here on the right of what the upper GI tract looks like, which consists of your mouth, it consists of your esophagus or food pipe, also your stomach, and the first third of your small intestine, which also goes by the name of the duodenum. Uh, remember the mouth and the esophagus are really critical for uh, swallowing. Uh, and remember, Duchenne tends to be a, a disease of skeletal muscle in the and, and the majority of your GI system is smooth muscle with a few caveats in that the upper esophagus tends to be skeletal muscle. So we can see issues with swallowing uh, in our boys with, with Duchenne. 
Again, some common problems that we do see can include something called GERD and dysphagia. So what is GERD? GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease. This goes by many names, uh, GERD, reflux, acid reflux, heartburn, indigestion, they're all getting at the same idea, the same concept that stomach, which is supposed to live in, or stomach acid, which is supposed to live in your stomach, is rising into your esophagus. And the cells of your esophagus are not meant to handle acid. So a lot of times it burns, it stings, um, can cause a, a plethora of symptoms, including pain, can cause nausea and vomiting. It can lead to, to belching, hiccups, sour taste in the mouth. These are things that I often hear in my clinic when, when patients are complaining of reflux or GERD. Um, the diagnosis itself is also oftentimes based just on history, but we can do some uh, some more testing if needed. So sometimes we'll do something called an endoscopy, which is a camera test, which requires anesthesia um, to look to see, are we seeing signs of acid reflux damage in the esophagus? And we can also do something called a pH study where we stick a probe uh, into the esophagus and it will measure the acid content of the esophagus for 24 or 48 hours. The goal of treatment for reflux is really to suppress acid to limit the complications of acid reflux in the esophagus. And a lot of times we can do this with diet, lifestyle changes, but also sometimes maybe medications. Again, the first line of treatment is really to manage it supportively and, and conservatively. So the first thing we talk about is, is let's limit the foods that may provoke or trigger acid reflux. So here's a list of foods on the right that, that tend to provoke reflux spicy foods, greasy foods, carbonated beverages, coffee, caffeine, chocolate, citrus, all these foods tend to make a little bit more acid in your stomach and they actually weaken the connection between your food pipe and your stomach, making it easier for foods to rise. So those are the first foods that we want to take out of our diet uh, when we're having bad symptoms of reflux. Um, it's better if you eat more Frequent meals, smaller rather than three large or four large meals in a day that can help your stomach digest quicker and have less symptoms of reflux. I often recommend that my patients don't lie down at least two hours after eating a meal, um, meaning I, our late night snackers or grazers who raid the fridge and then go lay down um, immediately to go to sleep tend to have symptoms of reflux pretty severe when they wake up in the morning. So avoid late night snacking. Obviously, exercise and weight loss, if, if those are options, can help your symptoms. But if these conservative measures fail, uh, then you really do want to consider medications. There are a lot of medications out there to treat reflux. Uh, they come in a couple classifications. The most benign are these things called antacids. This is where you think about aluminum hydroxide, calcium carbonate. These go by Tums, Maalox, uh, Mylanta. These coat the esophagus. They're almost an immediate onset of action, so quick symptom relief, but they tend to be out of your system um, within about 10, 15, maybe even up to 30 minutes. Uh, so they're quick acting short term. The next step is to use something called an H2 blocker or histamine release blockers. Um, these go by the name of famotidine or cimetidine. This is your Pepsid. Um, there was a brand called ranitidine, which has recently been taken off the market. These block your acid receptors in your stomach. They can take a few minutes, up to 30 minutes to really kick in, but they can last up to four to six hours, can be given twice a day if needed. If those tend to be ineffective, then our best case uh, medication-wise would be to use something called a proton pump inhibitor or a PTI. This is your omeprazole or Prilosec, your lansoprazole or Prevacid, pantoprazole protonics, your Nexium. These irreversibly block the pumps in your stomach that produce acid. They take a while to kick in, so it's a one to two hour onset of action, but they can last 12 to 24 hours. Um, there's a lot of data coming out in adults, which is varying from children. So children who take these medicines um, long term can start to have some issues with vitamin D absorption, which they see a lot more commonly in adults. So I oftentimes will have my patients, if they're taking these medicines uh, for more than three months, supplement with vitamin D and calcium. Again, just going back to you know skeletal growth, bone growth, bone health uh, for our boys with Duchenne. If you're on a medicine like this, a PPI, you should supplement with calcium and vitamin D. All right, what about dysphagia? So dysphagia really means difficulty swallowing, and it's really important to differentiate dysphagia for solids from dysphagia for solids and liquids. 
So we want to know, are kids having trouble swallowing solid foods or do they choke and gag even when they're drinking liquids? It's very important for your doctor to know. Um, there's three phases of swallowing and there can be problems at each of the phases. Um, the first is the oral phase. This is where you chew your food and you, put, you, you form something called a food bolus. Kids who have problems here tend to have drooling. They tend to be unable to handle their secretions, so they're constantly spitting out their saliva. They may excessively chew and spit out their food. That can tell you there may be a problem in the mouth. There's a pharyngeal phase. This is where you uh, move food to the back of the throat, getting it ready to be physically swallowed. Most kids who have problems here will gag while they're attempting to swallow. And the third phase is the esophageal uh, phase, which is uh, what most kids tend to complain is that they can feel their food going down their throat. They feel food gets stuck. Sometimes it may get stuck and they vomit to help it come back up. So Knowing where in the swallowing mechanism things are becoming problematic is really helpful for the doctor to know. Remember, skeletal muscle is involved in all three of these phases of swallowing. So how do we test for dysphagia? So there's several tests. One is called a barium swallow, or goes by the name of an upper GI series, if these ever get ordered for your child. This is really uh, to detect any anatomic abnormalities uh, within the esophagus or the upper GI uh, system. This involves swallowing some thin liquid barium and taking some x-rays to really just look at anatomy. There's something called a video fluoroscopic swallow study. This is done with a speech pathologist and a radiologist um, to watch the physical maneuvers of swallowing and eating to make sure that food is not going down the wrong pipe, meaning we're not aspirating. So this looks at um, during the process of swallowing uh, is contrast getting into the trachea and lungs as opposed to going down the esophagus as it should. We can do something called upper endoscopies, as you see here. So this is a, a picture of a, an anesthesia test with the doctor putting a tube through the mouth, going down the esophagus into the stomach. This really looks for um, the physical damage that could be happening uh, within the esophagus. And then there's a test called manometry, which involves placing a catheter through the nose into the esophagus, which has pressure sensors, which can then tell us about more muscle nerve issues with regard to swallowing issues. So with regard to the upper GI tract, uh, the goals of, of, of what we want to take home here is, you know, we really do want to prevent reflux-like symptoms proactively. So let's stay on top of some diet changes. Let's avoid some of those reflux-provoking foods. Um, make sure that we're not late night snacking uh, and really um, just be on top of healthy eating. If you are prescribed a medication for your reflux, remember they are safe to take. Just do remember that if you are on a PPI for more than three to six months, we really should be either checking a vitamin D level or supplementing with vitamin D and calcium. And then with regard to dysphagia or swallowing issues, it's really important to try and isolate where in the swallowing mechanism uh, your child is having issues. It can be very helpful for the doctor to, to formulate a plan. All right, lastly, we're going to move on now to the lower GI system, something that's very common in the general population, but then also quite common in our boys with Duchenne. So constipation, this has to do with the lower GI system. Um, it's estimated that, you know, 3 million, even 4 or 5 million Americans every year receive some sort of medication for constipation. Um, it's been documented that it occurs in 10 to 20 percent of children regardless in the U.S. Uh, can make up up to about 5 percent of a general visit to a general pediatrician. Uh, and for a pediatric GI specialist my, like myself, this can be anywhere from 10 to 25 percent of what I see on a typical day. So the dictionary defines constipation uh, as a term used to describe the subjective complaint of passage of abnormally delayed or infrequent passage of dry hardened feces. So in essence, this is hard stools. These are large stools, infrequent stools, or discomfort with stools. So this can try and delineate what constipation may mean uh, to one person compared to the next. Um, in medicine, we like to have conferences and where experts meet and then put together criteria. So uh, over the last several decades, there have been several Rome criteria that have come out with regard to GI issues. Uh, and the most recent are called the Rome 4 criteria that have to deal with this thing called functional constipation. So constipation in our medical GI um, 
arena is defined as the presence of two or more of the following for at least 25% of your bowel movements. You know, having less than three bowel movements per week, straining with at least a quarter of those stools, having hard stools, incomplete evacuation. Those are the kids who, you know, pass a bowel movement and then 15, 20 minutes later feel like they just hadn't gotten everything out and have to go back and, and let more go. Um, the sensation of a blockage down there, feeling like you have to go but nothing comes out, uh, or even needing to use manual maneuvers, uh, digital rectals to disimpact or pull out stool means that your child is likely constipated. So how about in Duchenne itself? So this was a nice study um, that looked at how prevalent constipation was uh, in our boys and men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this was was uh, looked at 120 patients from the age of five all the way up to 30. Um, it was a questionnaire that was given out to these patients that used the Rome 3 criteria. So just a little bit um, um, prior to the most recent criteria, but very similar. And the results were pretty fascinating. So almost half of the patients uh, that filled out the the questionnaire fulfilled the criteria of having constipation. Um, it did not seem to be affected by your age or your ambulatory status, so it was almost similar across all boards. Um, and in those who were constipated, um, less than 50% were actually prescribed a constipation regimen. And even in those who were treated with a medicine for constipation, only half of them had reported resolution of symptoms. So at the end of the day, this tells me that in Duchenne, um, constipation is it's really prevalent uh, it's underdiagnosed or underrecognized, and even when it is recognized, it seems to be undertreated, right? So we want to make sure that we're staying on top of our bowel regimen um, just to give our boys the best chance to have a healthy GI system. Uh, I wanted to quickly talk about something that I hear often. Uh, is something called encopresis. Encopresis is a medical term for stool leakage. In essence, this is a picture that depicts a hard fecal burden or uh, hard form of a uh, piece of stool which is stuck in the rectum and if it can't come out your body is constantly making stool loose stool will, will start to leak around so the green arrows will leak around the hard rock of stool and you'll start having stool accidents so if you start noticing our boys are having uh, stool leaks smears in the underwear they didn't feel that they had a bowel movement but something was there uh, there's a high chance that they have a fecal impaction and need to have medications to to break up this stool burden so how do we treat constipation? Um, there's maintenance therapy. This has a lot to do with uh, our diet. So we want to increase our fluids. Really, really, really want to make sure that we're drinking plenty of fluids, making sure that our diet's well balanced with lots of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, um, behavior modification. It's really important to have your children sit on the toilet uh, several times a day after big meals tends to be the big time to really train your body to have a bowel movement. And if those aren't working, then we need to be aggressive with our bowel regimen uh, and use medications as they are very, very safe. So the most uh, benign is something called fiber or solu uh, soluble fiber. Fiber in the intestine absorbs water from the intestine and it forms a bulky or easy to pass stool. Um, foods that are high in fiber are some fruits like raspberries, apples, or pears. Uh, for apples and pears, the fiber lives in the skin, so don't take that off. Uh, whole grains, lentils, peas, broccoli, carrots. Um, this fiber can actually help draw more water to your intestines so that we can soften up stool. Rule of thumb for your fiber requirements for a day or however old your child is, plus five. Um, when you step out of the dietary soluble fibers, you, you start moving into some of the medication options. Um, mineral oil or castor oil are something that we use often. This is a lubricant. This can help if we're passing very firm stools, rock hard stools, to put a thin film uh, on, on the outside of the stool, making the passage a little easier. Um, you take one to two tablespoons a day, and again, it helps just soften the stool. Um, this can actually be given rectally, but can also be given orally. And we want to think about our stimulant laxatives. So these are things like senna or bisacoidal, x lax or bucolax. These, in essence, cause irritation and aligning of the intestine, which cause contraction. So this is physically moving things through your intestine. Um, they should be used sparingly, but in short term, for a week, for two weeks, given daily, they are okay. There is some literature to suggest that they may be habit forming, um, but in kids, that literature is starting to be uh, 
um, is starting to become a little bit defunct. So we are using these aggressively, especially for children who need them. Um, again, they irritate the lining of the intestine and they cause some cramping, which then moves things through your intestine to produce a bowel. Sometimes people need to use glycerin or saline suppositories or enemas. These are rectal medicines. Um, they lubricate the stool at the bottom and they soften it so that it's easier to pass. Um, but again, I like to use these more sparingly since the medicines we have by mouth tend to work pretty efficiently. Um, the last is these things called osmotic laxatives. These are insoluble fibers um, or synthetic sugars. This one is called lactulose. Uh, this again draws water into the colon, which is the lowest part of the intestine, making it softer, making the stool softer and easier to pass. Um, and this can, you know, a tablespoon two or three times a day. This works pretty well for the younger children, tends to work a little bit less efficiently for the older, older children, adolescents, but can be effective. The most common that we use is something called Miralax. This is polyethylene glycol. Again, an insoluble fiber does not get sucked up into the body, stays in the gut, causes water to be retained inside the stool. It's very well tolerated. It's tasteless. It, it mixes well into a clear liquid. Um, the dose needs to be titrated, can be anywhere from half a cap to a cap, even two caps a day. Um, if taken appropriately, can be very, very effective. Um, it's not a quick fix. It tends to take a day or two or three to really get into the system to produce a stool. Uh, but when you do take it efficiently, it, it can work really well. I did just want to leave one quick note about the safety of Miralax. There have been anecdotal reports, mostly from parents and families, about the potential that Miralax has caused some behavioral issues in children. Um, and um, to date, there are no current studies to suggest um, that that's actually the case. Um, so our national society called NASPEGAN put out a statement several years ago uh, when this hit the news media um, saying this, that, that, that polyethylene glycol or Miralax is safe, um, that the byproduct of Miralax uh, does not seem to cause any harm. Um, there was a study that was um, that gained grant money to look at the safety of Miralax at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia several years ago. But unfortunately, as of last year, uh, the study was actually suspended and there was no data that was collected or produced. So um, to the best of our knowledge, many studies have been done looking um, at how well Miralax may work for different reasons and not as a primary outcome, but as a secondary outcome. Um, safety gets taken into account in, in all of these studies, and in all of these studies, there were no, no side effects uh, with regard to any behavioral issues uh, or severe adverse events with regard to Miralax. So very safe medicine. So how long do you use it? Really, this is based on expert opinion. Uh, most experts are motility experts and um, will say to use a maintenance dose of Miralax um, for at least a month of normal bowel movements. And when everything with regard to constipation has resolved for at least a month, then you can start thinking about tapering off or weaning off the medication. So goals for constipation, um, I often want my patients to have a daily soft bowel movement. At least every second day they should have a bowel movement. If we're getting to that third or fourth day, we can tell we're definitely getting a little bit more firm. It may be a little bit more difficult to pass. Uh, remember, frequent toilet sits can help. No distractions in the bathroom. Keep the iPhones, the iPads out of the bathroom. Kids will forget while they're there. They'll spend 30 minutes and forget that they're actually trying to have a bowel movement can worsen constipation. Um, make sure that we increase uh, our water intake, increase fiber in our diet, fruits, veggies, whole grains. And remember, if we do need to be on medicine, that they really are safe even long term. So that's really it. Uh, that kind of wraps up the talk here. Um, in essence, I went through the care considerations from this nice study in the Lancet with regard to GI health uh, for children with Duchenne. Um, remember that our nutritional assessment should happen at every visit. Remember, takeaway point should be let's limit fat intake, uh, let's push fluids, let's, let's check our vitamin D level and supplement if needed. With regard to the upper GI system, let's pay attention to symptoms of heartburn and reflux, swallowing issues. Let's work on some diet changes to avoid those occurrences. Again, if we need a medication, uh, they are safe under direct supervision. And then with regard to constipation, uh, it is common. Push fluids, whole grains, fiber, 
and laxatives are really safe to take. Um, don't be too alarmed uh, by what you hear. And that is all. So I'll stick around for some questions. Again, thank you again to the Jeff Foundation uh, for the privilege um, to give this talk again. I hope it was informative uh, and I'm happy to help. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan Cordova for that presentation. It was wonderful. Um, right now, we're gonna be opening up the Q&As. Um, please, again, feel free to throw in any questions you may have for Dr. Cordova in the chat below. Hi, folks. Uh, hope you guys can hear me, Danielle. All good? Yep, I sound good. All right, perfect, perfect. All right, so. Um, thanks again for the privilege. Again, it was a, it's an honor to always speak at these, you know, foundation roundtable virtual meetings. Um, sorry we can't meet in person, um, but uh, you know we'll do whatever we can to help uh, get some information out there that may be needed. So, um, for those of you who don't know, I do have a, a, a close connection to the Duchesne world. So my nephew is now 13. Levi Haynes uh, was diagnosed with Duchesne uh, in his early childhood, and um, you know, unfortunately, he's now wheelchair bound, but he's he's a great kiddo and and he is kind of my motivation for wanting to do these round tables and, and stay close to, to this community. So uh, you are my family, everybody in this, in this foundation, everybody who's dealing with Duchesne, please reach out to me with anything. Uh, many of you may know my sister, Perlita Haynes, uh, who's also a great advocate for this foundation and for, and for boys with Duchesne and advocating uh, uh, quite frequently for, for their overall health and well-being. Um, so sis, kudos to you. Thanks for, for including me in these and, and again, my contact information is is available with any questions whatsoever, at least from a GI standpoint, I'm happy to help. I have been rounded up uh, a couple times to, to speak on some other issues with Duchesne and medicine, and, and I'll try my best. Um, I will give you the caveat that I'm not a coronavirus expert. Uh, there's a lot of questions now uh, in my general population with regards to corona, uh, and uh, I know a little bit. If you have some questions, I'll, I'll try to answer those, but, uh, but um, maybe we'll stick to some GI health stuff. Um, all right, so I'm going to go through the chat here and just maybe go through some questions um, and maybe I'll just read some and then give you kind of my two cents. Uh, there's a question here. It says, my son quite, oh, I'm sorry, we're going down. My son quite often experiences gas problems after eating. How can I get him relief? Um, gas is interesting. Gas can be from a lot of different things. Obviously, acid reflux can do it to you. Um, there is also a concept that gas is a production, uh, I'm sorry, gas is produced by bacteria that live within your intestine um digesting your food so it's important to know where the gas is coming from right so is it is it i eat food and then i get gassy uh shortly after and i'm burping a lot that's different than if i'm uh, eating food and 15 20 minutes an hour later i'm getting gassy and i'm passing flatus or uh, you know i'm passing gas from below um probiotics can be helpful for the latter so things that contain something called lactobacillus um which goes by a brand name of culturel there's a lot of other brands out there gerber soothe i believe is another um, or something called bifidobacter, which goes by the name of a line, and then another one that's called Florastor. These can be really helpful. These are healthy gut bacteria. My whole concept with gas is that, you know, if it's a bacteria issue, it often depends on what kind of food we eat. Um, so things that produce a lot of gas are things like onions, garlic, celery, raisins, caffeine can do it, chocolate can do it. So trying to minimize your gas production. And then with regard to bacteria and probiotics is if you can outnumber the bad gas producing bacteria with healthy gut bacteria, that can also be helpful. So I like probiotics for gas below, obviously making sure that we're not constipated, right? So if 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 we really are on that firm stool, infrequent stool, and things can't get out, your body's constantly processing your food, um, pushing against hard stool, you're gonna get gassy and bloated. So making sure we're on top of our bowel regimen. If it's more of gas in terms of upper GI, I'm belching a lot, maybe I'm hiccuping, Something called semethicone, gas X, these can help burst gas bubbles in your stomach. Um, they tend to work, I would say, about 50 to 60% of the time. Obviously, you, in those instances, really want to make sure that it's not any other symptom, other, you know, things like reflux that we talked about. So um, that's my two cents on, on gas. Um, questions about water intake, 100 ounces for sedentary, 100 ounces. So this is all based on on total bo body fluid requirement. So this is um, these are all calculated mostly based on age, but also on weight. So I agree, 100 ounces is probably a lot for somebody who's sedentary. Um, but I would say at least 60 to 80 ounces of fluid. That doesn't mean water alone, right? You have to start thinking about some of our foods. Obviously, 
salads, lettuce, broccoli, fruits, they contain liquid too. Those can be, you know, when you're getting to the root of it, those can be calculated in our fluid intake. Um, let's see, a couple questions about keto diets. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not too familiar with keto diets with regard to Duchenne. Uh, that may be a, a question better for your, uh, your uh, DMD physician. Um, keto diets, in essence, are high fat diets. Um, and that's, again, something that we should, we should take into account with them, sorry. Uh, how often should we have a swallow study? So swallow studies, again, are, are those things that look at um, our physical ability to swallow, to make sure that things are not getting stuck uh, either in the esophagus or that we're not aspirating. So kids who aspirate, meaning they drink liquid, they cough, it goes into their lungs, the coughing mechanism is actually something that protects it's a protective mechanism to prevent liquids and foods getting into the lungs. So coughing is actually okay, but kids who often cough often, um, there's a concern they could be aspirating into their into their trachea or into their windpipe. So we usually say getting a swallow evaluation either with an x-ray called a barium swallow that we talked about or seeing somebody called an ENT or an ear, nose, and throat doctor. They can sometimes also at the bedside put a thin caliber camera through the nose and watch what happens when our boys swallow to really say, hey, listen, are we getting better or worse? You know, there's pros and cons to both types of swallow studies. Um, the swallow study regarding, uh, with regard to barium and, and an x-ray is exposing our kids to, to radiation, right? So we wanna minimize those, especially in our children as much as we can. The caveat is that if you go see an ENT uh, and they, and they want to do a bedside evaluation, they're, they're sticking a camera inside your child's nose while they're awake can be pretty uncomfortable. So um, I would say having a swallow study probably, I would say at least once a year, if it's abnormal, maybe twice a year. Um, all right, let's keep going. There's lots of questions and I don't want to miss anybody here. Um, what do you study for check for? Okay, so uh, again, question about, um, could you explain what each study to check for an upper GI works? So again, the study is in essence to look at the upper GI system. There's the barium swallow, which is a, a swallow test just to look at anatomy. Kid swallows, we take a couple x-rays, we make sure that the plumbing of the upper GI system is intact, that nothing's obstructed. This can also look for something called a hiatal hernia, which I didn't allude to in the talk, but a hiatal hernia is prevalent in boys with Duchenne. Um, which in essence is a weakness of muscles and ligaments within your abdomen that unfortunately allow your stomach to rise up into your chest. It can cause a lot of symptoms like heartburn. It can cause reflux that doesn't get better with medications um, and really needs some diet changes and, and in some instances may need a surgery to correct. So that's called a hiatal hernia and that will be found on an upper GI. The swallow study we talked about uh, is a similar test, but again, looks at the swallowing mechanisms while you're eating or drinking. An endoscopy is something that I do quite often, um, and that is an anesthesia test to look at the esophagus physically to look for signs of damage from acid reflux. Can also look for other causes of heartburn or reflux or swallowing issues, um, but that is anesthesia. That is where we take samples, biopsies from the esophagus, so we can look under the microscope to see damage, what's really going on. Um, let's see, next question. My son is a six-year-old. He says, I have stomach pain. Local doctors say nothing there. Would you mind attending? Maybe we can talk afterwards. Send me an email. We'll, we'll, we'll get through some of these uh, little nuances if there's a specific question, happy to help. Um, next question, is two ounces daily dose of Miralax effective or too low to be effective? We started with eight ounces and gradually. So. Remember, Miralax comes as a powder. Um, you should use the scoop that is inside the container, or if it comes as a packet, the whole packet is, is one full scoop, or cap full, I should say. Um, that's 17 grams. So in a 17 gram dose, which is a typical dose, one cap of Miralax, it should be mixed with at least six to eight ounces of fluid. Um, it's best if it works, I should say, it works best with clear liquids, water, juice, Gatorade, it tends not to be as effective if you mix it with milk or dairy products. Um, part of the, the medicine gets bound to the protein in dairy. And I feel like I, in the kiddos who, who drink it with milk, they tend to need a lot higher doses than what I would suspect. Um, so I usually recommend using a clear liquid. It does have to be in enough liquid. So two ounces for a full cap is not enough. 
Um, you need at least, I would say, six to eight ounces of that liquid. And the other part is for it to work effectively, you need to chug it. So I tell my kids, you know, if you can't chug, set a timer, five minutes, maybe 10 minutes max. If it's taking all day to drink my Miralax, it is not effective. Um, it needs to be chugged. It needs to go fast through the stomach into the intestine to get all the way down to the colon to be effective. So um, for Miralax, make sure full cap with at least six ounces. If they can't, our kids just aren't gonna drink it. They taste it, they feel it. I say split the dose, take half a cap of Miralax in you know, three ounces of liquid, do that in the morning, do that at night. Again, it shouldn't make you produce a bowel movement. It's just to get things softer so that eventually things will eventually start to come out. Um, a question about veggie smoothies. Veggie smoothies, I think, are great as long as we're getting enough fiber. Um, there are some studies now, more from a GI health standpoint, thinking about smoothies in general, in that we may be giving our body a huge rush of sugar all in one setting. So if you throw in, you know, your daily allotment of fruit and veggies in one smooth in one smoothie, thinking, hey, listen, we're going to get it in once and it'll be fine, we may be stressing our pancreas which is something that's needed to produce insulin, which is something that then breaks down your sugar to kind of give you energy and then store that energy. So I think a smoothie here and there is fine. Would I do a breakfast smoothie with my whole allotment once a day? Probably not the best idea. A lot of those kids will get a, a peak of energy from the sugar uh, pretty quickly and then may crash, meaning they feel really tired, down, lethargic uh, an hour or two later. So be careful about smoothies. Um, do I recommend uh, using procedures with anesthesia? So the endoscopy is 100% done in, under anesthesia. I wouldn't let anybody talk you into doing an, an endoscopy on your child without anesthesia. They can be pretty uncomfortable. The rest of the procedures um, should not be done under anesthesia. So that's the only one that I can think of that sh should definitely be done under anesthesia. Um, something in... Spanish, I think. Let's see if I can decipher my Spanish reading skills. Something for testing vitamin D, winter versus summer. Are the results different? Yes, so they will be different. So a, a kid who comes, remember, there's a number 30. We like to aim for 30. I'll be honest, I really like to aim for the number 40. If a kid has a vitamin D level who's 40, they're happy. They don't need to be supplemented. Um, but if it's you know in the 30s or under 30s, yes, time of year will be important. Also, the geography where you live. So I'm sitting here in Chicago, it's you know early May and it's 35 degrees without much sun. So um, checking vitamin D different time periods is also important to be taken into account. All right, let's see here. Probiotics, a um, couple questions on probiotics, things that I recommend. Again, the ones that I like most for gut health are things that contain uh, lactobacillus, things that contain bifidobacter and things that contain uh, another organism called Sarcomyces. So these go by brand names, again, of Culturel, Align, Floristore, Gerber. There's a really good probiotic out there. Um, it used to go by the name of VSL number three, if any of you, if anybody's been on that. It had some legal issues with regard to branding about a year and a half ago, two years ago. So it was taken off the market, but it now goes by the name of something called VizBiome. That's used to be a prescription where I could call it in and, and pharmacies would cover it. And, and in the last year and a half, I don't think I've been, I don't think I've had anybody uh, have their insurance company pay for their probiotics. So this biome is one that I like the best. Um, it can be expensive. It needs to be refrigerated. It comes as capsules and it comes as a packet, which you can take once a day. It's usually a half to one packet a day or two to four capsules a day. Um, you can find it online. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, I've had some patients tell me they can find it at Costco. So uh, Viz Biome is kind of my go-to probiotic. There's another one uh, that's similar in structure with regard to the, pro, um, the probiotic bacteria composition that's in there, um, which does not have to be refrigerated. And that one goes by the name of Orthobiotic. Um, I found that one on Amazon. Again, I've had some success with it. The, the thought behind probiotics are that if you're Re needing to refrigerate them. That means that they're alive. They're live active cultures. Those tend to work best compared to the over-the-counter uh, ones that sit on the shelf, um, and those are inactive. But, you know, cost effectiveness, you know, probiotics have been studied for a lot of different things. There are, you know, hundreds of brands out there. The ones containing lactobacillus, bifidobacter, sarcomyces, those are the most healthy for your gut. So I would, I would try to find a brand that suits your needs, but that has some of those within them. 
All right, guys, I'm going to keep going through some of these questions. Um, I'm wondering about children who have nearly daily bowel movements still having constipation. Last doctor visit, we could see he was constipated in his x-ray. We were surprised. Wondering about Miralax for a five-year-old. Okay, so that brings up a great point. So we use a lot of x-ray, or I should say the medical community uses a lot of x-ray to diagnose constipation, and I would not use an x-ray to, to diagnose constipation. X-rays can really overestimate the amount of stool that is inside your intestine. So, for instance, I do procedures called colonoscopies. That's where kids have to drink a bowel regimen, give them very bad diarrhea, in essence, wipe their system clean. I do a colonoscopy, meaning I, I stick a camera through their tush, I look around their colon, and then I'm done. And in some instances, I've had to do an x-ray 15, 20 minutes later after being done with a colonoscopy, completely clean colon, and the x-ray has been read as an abundance of stool, large stool burden, constipation. So our x-rays aren't great at picking up constipation. Um, so I would go so, more so on clinical. Is my kid having a daily bowel movement? If they are, does it hurt? Is it painful? Do they feel like they're getting everything out or are they leaking? And then obviously, you know, seeing your pediatrician to just lay hands on the belly and say, do I feel stool? Kids who are really constipated, who are backed up, firm stools, large stools, you know, oftentimes you can feel that on an exam. So be careful about x-rays. Do we use them? Sometimes. Um, would I put a lot of weight in an x-ray? Probably not. Five-year-old constipation, uh, I would say start with half a cap of Miralax. Again, maybe three to four ounces of liquid and try and drink it fast. All right, at which time of year should we check the vitamin D, winter, summer? Okay, so I think we talked about that one. Um, how long can my son stay on Miralax if it helps him stay regular every day? He takes Senna and a probiotic with it. He goes every day with ease on the regimen, but is it a crutch or a harmful? Good question. So, you know, to date, it doesn't seem like it's going to be too much uh, of a crutch as long as your body can go with the aid of some of these medicines like Miralax, like Senna. Uh, it's actually really important to your doctors because it tells me that actually the function of his gut, while it may be a little bit in quotes lazy, can work. So it's it's less of an actual nerve or muscle issue, more so of, hey, listen, I just have to get things moving through my gut. So, you know, I have kids on Miralax sometimes for several months, even up to a year or two. Um, I do attempt when things are going really well to come off medicine. I, I am a big proponent of, you know, the less the better. Uh, if we no longer need it, why give a medicine? So if he's been on Miralax for a while, more than several months, no stool issues, um, the first thing that I would back off on in this instance would be the Senna, which is the stimulant. I like to use Senna more as an as needed. You know, it's been three days, I haven't had a bowel movement, then use the Senna. That one will give you the push to go to the bathroom. Um, and if that one comes off and he's still going well, then I would say cut the Miralax in half if you're doing a dose or a cap once a day, cut down to um, half a cap a day for maybe a week or two, make sure things are going okay, and then give it a try to stop it, right? Just remember that taking away that um, fiber source, we, we need to stay on top of our dietary means. So lots of fruits and veggies, lots of well-rounded uh, soluble fiber, lots of water uh, once you come off medicine. And don't be discouraged if you feel like, you know, a couple weeks later he needs to go back on Miralax because, you know, some of these boys, like we said, have, and some of these kids in general have a lazy gut um, and sometimes need just a little extra help. So several months on Miralax, completely safe. I have kids who are on it and swear on it, swear by it, you know, for a year or two. I think trying to wean off of it, lowest effective dose can be really helpful. Um, all right. If the stool is thick, putting blob, is it time to stop the Miralax? Again, that's, that's a good question. Um, as long as it's not painful, as long as it's, uh, your child doesn't complain, there's no tummy aches around having a belly, um, a bowel movement, then I think, yes, it's probably time to start weaning down on the Miralax, maybe cut the dose in half like we just alluded to for the last kiddo, and then, uh, and then give it a chance to stop. Um, all right, thoughts on incorporating fermented foods. I think fermented foods, a lot of that stuff we, we may have alluded to, I think they're fine. I think a lot of the, the kefir products are, are a good um, healthy way to get some probiotics in, if that's what you're alluding to. Um, Otherwise, if we're having issues with gas and reflux, you may want to be a little bit careful. Some of those fermented products do produce a lot of gas once they do get digested in your gut. Um, so be cautious. Um, all right, my son is complaining about swallowing pills, but his swallow study showed no aspiration. How fast could someone uh, decline being able to swallow? So 
this is important. So depending on age, I mean, I have teenagers who still struggle to swallow pills. Um, there's something about the, the mental capacity of wanting to actually physically swallow a pill. There's just some, some deterrent to kids that they just have a problem with it. So as long as you can swallow liquids, not concerned at all, as long as your child can swallow soft things, you know, mashed potatoes, pasta noodles, yogurt, ice cream, those kind of things, that's great. If they can eat solid foods without any swallowing issues, not an issue whatsoever. If it's just a pill thing, it may be a little behavior or psychological, just something we have to work on. Um, but it should not go quickly, meaning your swallowing should not deteriorate um, quickly, as long as you can still eat and drink um, without issue. I will give a caveat or a, a, a quick note, you know, since our boys are on many medications, please, please, please have all your boys take medication with some liquid. Do not have your kids swallow medications dry. A lot of medications are coated uh, with a, you know, capsules are coated. Those tend to go down okay, but I, I do run into, you know, every couple of months, you know, a child in the, you know, 10 o'clock at night forgot to take their medicine. They're just going to take it while they're in bed, no water. And then all of a sudden they can develop something called pill esophagitis, which is a, in essence, an ulcer or a canker sore that can happen in the esophagus from a pill getting stuck. All right. So the classic medicine, and, and your boys may be on these medicines at some point, is something called doxycycline. Doxycycline is a medication used for acne. So if any of your boys are taking doxycycline, that is one 100% needs to be taken with liquid, half a glass of water, and then should stay upright for about 15 to 20 minutes. Make sure that pill didn't get stuck. Um, so, sorry, long-winded answer, uh, but regard to swallowing pills, if they can eat and drink and it's just a pill thing, it may be behavioral. Um, all right, next we mix uh, a cap of Miralax, eight ounces of juice, and then give him four ounce portion daily. Stool is thick but every other day. Again, the norm actually in the in the general population to have a bowel movement, you know, at least every other day, some every third day can be normal. So as long as it's not painful, um, I think a half a cap of Miralax, which is looks like what you're doing here should be okay. If it starts becoming painful or he starts going to that every third day, it may be a sign that you, you wanna give him a full cap every day for maybe a week or so and then start to back down. Uh, perfect, perfect, thank you, thank you. Uh, x-ray was part of his six month DMD appointment, perfect. Oh, with regard to the x-ray. So yeah, I would, I would caution uh, the use of x-rays to diagnose constipation. Again, if somebody's asking about bowel movements regimen, if it's not a GI specialist, um, I, would, I would be very cautious on what shows up on the x-ray. If you think your child's doing fine, passing normal stools, there's no issues, we're not on medicine, I would not start a child on Miralax or a bowel regimen um, just solely based on an x-ray, so, so take caution. Um, is urinating often a sign of constipation or probably due to steroids? Um, so kids who have constipation to the point of maybe having those poop accidents, the onchopresis, the fecal soiling, there is some thought that if there's a huge stool rock that's sitting in your colon, your pelvis is pretty small and there's a lot of structures that are down there, one including your bladder. And if there's a if there's a poop mass that's not moving or there's infrequent stool, so you have a lot of stool within your within your pelvis, that can push on your bladder. And if you have a full bladder, you can have pee accidents. So enuresis. This is usually more than just nighttime wetting. So nighttime wetting is common in boys regardless. Steroids can play an effect. Um, but if it's a daytime, I'm having accidents for, for urine um, and we don't know why, we do need to take into consider constipation. So sometimes we get those kids to somebody called a urologist who, um, forgive me for saying this, may be a plumber of the, of the lower urinary system. They oftentimes wanna make sure that constipation is, is treated before thinking that this is a true bladder urine issue. So um, nighttime wetting, common, if it happens in the daytime, think about constipation. If it's not constipation, then maybe see a urologist. Um, oh, sorry. And also the question was urinating often. Again, that may be, if, if there's constipation, maybe, um, but steroids can definitely do it for sure. Um, if he's taking meds with Miralax, uh, meds in milk in the morning, should he do Miralax in the evening? I think that's fine. 
Um, I think Miralax, again, taking at any time of day is fine, just remembering to take it. Um, it's the stimulant medicines, the things called Exlax or Dulcolax or Senna, the ones that actually give you that urge to go to the bathroom. I often recommend taking those um, uh, sometime midday because you know their onset of action is usually anywhere between 30 minutes up to a couple hours. So I don't like giving those right before bedtime. Kids will wake up with the urge to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Um, in normal times, if we were, you know, back in school, I often don't like kids taking those first thing in the morning. They may have to go to the bathroom at school and that may pose some, some issues. Most kids don't like going to the bathroom at school. So I usually say for those kids in the typical day, you know, take the Exlax or the Senna, uh, the stimulant medicine, maybe as soon as they get home from school uh, to help produce a bowel movement likely before they go to bed that day. Um, my kid takes Nexium because of steroids. How far apart should he take them? Um, I'll be honest, there's been a lot of literature looking at this, not so much for boys with Duchenne, but more so with boys with asthma who, and boys and girls with asthma who are on chronic steroids, inhaled steroids, and needing something like a Nexium. And, and new schools of thought are that it, unless you're having active symptoms of heartburn, reflux, stomach aches when eating, burping, those kind of symptoms to really think they have acid reflux, really don't need the Nexium. So um, you may want to think about... Um, you know, talking to whoever's giving you the Nexium to see whether or not they need it. Um, but steroids alone is not a real indication to take Nexium any longer. Obviously, if there's other reasons he needs to take it, by all means, he should take it. Um, Nexium is one of those medicines that needs to be taken a specific way. These are, again, the, the proton pump inhibitors, very similar to Prilosec uh, or Omeprazole or Prevacid. So these need to be taken on an empty stomach 30 minutes before a meal. Um, it doesn't have to, you don't have to eat, but if you're going to eat, it's got to be at least 30 minutes. It's got to be on an empty stomach um, or at least two hours after a meal. So I usually have my kids take Nexium uh, first thing in the morning, you know, brush their teeth, get ready for school, and then have some breakfast. If they forget, then it's, you know, wait at least two hours after a meal and then take your Nexium. Um, and I think that is the last one. Sorry that. You know, I tend to talk a little fast. Hopefully you guys could hear me. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody's questions got answered. Um, I am still here and happy to help if there's any other questions. Again, Danielle and everybody at the Jeff Foundation, thank you again for the for the opportunity to have this uh, have this talk and this in this Q and A. And you know, hopefully once this pandemic settles down and we start getting back to to live conferences, hopefully I'll I'll have the opportunity to meet some of you in person and uh, and and help out as much as I can. Absolutely, I thought this was a fantastic webinar and thank you so much for answering all those questions. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, so if that's the case, we can wrap things up. But again, Dr. Cordova, thank you so, so much again and your commitment to Duchenne as well. Um, for those who attended, thank you all so much for joining us. We will be hosting this website on our, um, we'll be hosting this presentation on our website after this as well. So please feel free to share with your friends that you could benefit from this as well in the community. Um, but that's it. Thank you again. And thank you all for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.